colleagues, uh, in particular some USGS colleagues who are co-authors on this talk and couldn't uh, travel. Uh, USGS has implemented some travel restrictions and uh, I got to be the one to come and talk to you today. So let's make it clear that I'm, you know, talking and working here today on behalf of these guys. Um, I'm going to talk to you about forage fish in Lake Michigan. You guys are getting used to hearing uh, a couple of uh, talks on this topic, I hope, and uh, today it will be a combination of talks from the two surveys that we do. The bottom trawl survey, which has been going on for on a more or less lake-wide basis about 40 years now, or it will be 40 this year, and the acoustic survey, which has been going on for 17 years. Uh, we have these two surveys for a number of reasons. We think that, in essence, they are complementary. The bottom trawl survey obviously is something that will do better at sampling um, benthic fish, but it also does a pretty good job of tracking some benthopelagic fish that uh, undergo diel vertical migration, fish like alewife and bloater and smelt. Uh, there are things the bottom trawl survey does not do well that we think the acoustic survey does pretty well. Uh, one of those things is the bottom trawl survey, it's pretty tough to come up with catch curves that w have a descending limb that start at age zero. If you want to study recruitment, uh, and particularly recruitment of organisms that are getting eaten more or less the moment they're born, it's pretty important to be able to assess them as early as possible. Um, the other thing that the acoustic survey does that we can't pull off with the bottom trawl survey, no matter how hard we try, is a lake-wide survey. That's simply because it's possible to sample in places with acoustic gear that you can't sample with bottom trawls because you'll lose your trawl. So um, we think that these surveys are fairly complementary and have uh, over the past several years started to become pretty informative about uh, what's going on with forage fish in Lake Michigan. The talk that I'm going to give to you today uh, will be in three basic session sections. The first will be fish that are sampled by both gears relatively well, uh, in addition to uh, species that are sampled by both gears. There's going to be a couple of topics in here that are sort of specific to the gear. Um, the second section will be uh, species that are sampled only with the bottom trawl. And uh, finally, uh, the third section will be take home messages uh, based on um, our brain trust working on uh, evaluating these data. So, obviously, one of the important fish in Lake Michigan is alewife. Um, we have uh, in this slide a graph showing uh, on the x-axis year, the y-axis biomass density in kilograms per hectare from the bottom trawl survey. You're going to see a series of slides that have the same basic pattern. The y-axis is going to be biomass density and I'll try to make sure I point out to you whether or not it's from the bottom trawl survey or the acoustic survey. Um, what we can see in this slide is basically th what I think we would call three stanzas in biomass of alewife, adult alewife, over time. We have this stanza right here, pretty high alewife biomass from the early part of the time series up to about 1982. Uh, then we reached that point in time when we had fairly level alewife biomass. It bounced around quite a bit, but it was you know fairly consistent up through about 2004, at which point in 2004 we had uh, apparently a, a new paradigm <laughs> where we've uh, reached a point where alewife biomass continues to decline and has been very consistent at much, more lo much lower levels than we've seen it at any time other than, you know, say 82 to 85. In addition to this uh, effort we have to estimate the biomass of this fish with these prey fish surveys, we can also talk about life history of these fish, which tends to be fairly important. And one example of that for these adult alewife I can talk about and will talk about is how this change in biomass over time has been accompanied by 
some other things including a decrease in the maximum length of fish, decrease in their condition over time, as well as a truncation of the age composition. Oh, wrong button, sorry. <laughs> This is a graph that uh, some of you have probably seen before. It has total fish length on the x-axis and the y-axis is simply the percentage of the fish um, measured or aged. And what we can see is this group uh, or this slide is dominated by that red color. Um, basically that's one alewife year class that uh, based on the bottom trawl survey makes up 84 percent of the adult biomass. That number is actually a little bit higher from the acoustic survey. And it's 88 percent. Um, the other difference between the acoustic survey and the bottom trawl survey is the maximum age we got in the bottom trawl survey was age 5. In the acoustic survey we did get one age, I mean age 4, we got one age 5 fish in the acoustic survey. But the bottom line, either survey uh, you look at it tells you the same basic thing. We have very limited range of ages in the alewife population and they're dominated by one year class. Um, we think that this uh, truncation of the age composition has a cause. Um, if we look at this plot we can see over time that this uh, age composition has changed uh, pretty drastically as early or as late as 2008. Um, we had much more diverse age composition and basically you know we've seen this downhill slide for a number of years. This is something that happened in Lake Huron right before alewife collapsed in Lake Huron. Um, this is something that is a common response to high levels of fishing effort or in the case of Lake Michigan predation by mostly Chinook salmon but a number of other fish as well including everything from you know, well, let's just say whitefish. <laughs> so, um, but it's clear that we've had a truncation of ages, and uh, you know, given that truncation of ages, uh, one of the things you might expect is a life history response. A life history response, like they become mature at a smaller size, that's often a response fish have uh, to high levels of harvest or predation, and that's something that would be important. Uh, for this fish in order to help it sustain itself uh, in the face of heavy predation. So I can show you this graph though that shows even though we might expect that, that's not the case. Um, this graph shows on the x-axis year and on the y-axis an estimate of the length at 50 percent maturity for adult alewife uh, as measured from the bottom trawl data that we have and we can see that there's basically no trend. This is uh, potentially a big deal. Um, you know, if we have a situation where these fish are not responding by becoming mature at an earlier age, you're in a situation where if you knock enough of them back, there's not going to be any reproduction. So here's our first slide from the acoustic survey. It's uh, a slide showing the acoustic biomass estimate for age one or older alewife. Um, the bottom trawl survey we tend to divide species up mostly by length, the acoustic survey, because we know we can get at these fish at early ages. We try to break them down by age whenever possible. And uh, we can see some similarities between this graph and the bottom trawl graph in that the biomass in the 1990s was quite a bit higher than it was in the 2000s with a minor exception of a few years, uh, 2008, 2009, um, 2010 were about average. Those just happened to correspond to years, uh, Steve Potoven, wherever you are, that saw pretty low uh, Daphnia biomass and uh, these alewife have since declined to lower levels as you can see, uh, practically at all time lows and the Daphnia are coming back up. So we can see there's not much difference between the 2011 and 2012 data points uh, for the bottom trawl survey or the acoustic survey and we can see that they're pretty low um, in the case of the acoustic survey well below average which is this horizontal line across the chart that's the time series average. 
Another thing we can do uh, with the acoustic survey, uh, aside from you know, getting at the abundance of age zero fish, and because we can get at age zero fish in part, is start making some attempts to forecast the biomass of fish. And what we've done for the alewife, uh, using a combination of data from the bottom trawl survey and the acoustic survey, is to put together a forecast of alewife biomass for 2013. We looked at catch curves from uh, the data we collect in both surveys. Um, and what we see time and again, as I mentioned earlier, is we can start our descending limb at age zero for the acoustic survey. So it's pretty clear that we can use these data to estimate annual survival for significant portion of this population. So that's exactly what we did. Uh, we used catch curves to estimate annual survival for some recent cohorts, 2007, 2008, and 2010. And we used uh, the annual survival to predict the abundance of these fish in 2013 and measures or mean measures of weighted age over the past several years to come up with a way to expand that to biomass. And this is a plot showing uh, that last year, 2013, uh, the dotted line shows what our forecast range actually is. And this yellow point right there corresponds to what our predicted alewife biomass would be. And you can see that we're predicting there's going to be an increase. Uh, that increase is simply a, a result of increased mass of these fish. Um, we see, aside from that prediction being an increase, it's really not much different from 2012. Um, so ultimately, uh, looking at this prediction range, what we can see is first we have to remember that if mortality's been the same, these fish are gonna increase in biomass because of growth. Number two, we have to assume that the mortalities or the survival that we've estimated for the years for which we have data, for the cohorts for which we have data, will be the same in the future. That assumption may not hold. Uh, having said all that, uh, with the set of assumptions that this requires, the range of uh, potential biomass spans anywhere from about where it is now to about the lowest it's ever been to about average which is a pretty important thing to think about. And we've heard time and again that there's a lot of variability in the alewife and our ability to forecast where alewife are going has been limited by that variability. Um, measures of recruitment are pretty variable. Measures of survival are also relatively variable. But these are the best me measures we think we're likely to come up with. Um, so we're looking at potentially between about 10 and 52 kilotons. Uh, in 2013 if our assumptions hold. So the other uh, piece of information we can get from this survey for alewife, uh, the acoustic survey for alewife is an estimate of the young of year. You know, we sampled them when they're relatively small in August and one of the things that stands out pretty clearly in this plot is there have been a number of uh, relatively strong year classes in this time series but there haven't been a lot considering that there are 17 data points. If you look at 1995, 2005, and 2010, um, they're standout years. If you go back to, uh, if your memory is that good, the slides I showed you uh, showing what the age composition of the alewife pop population is, um, or what the age composition of the adults is, I mentioned that it was dominated by the 2010 year class. Well. There's the 2010 year class. Um, our observation of this large year class, strong year class in 2010 is clearly being borne out by uh, the fact that they're now dominating the biomass of the population. So now I'm gonna show you another slide from the bottom trawl survey for another relatively important fish species uh, in Lake Michigan, bloater. This is an organism that was at one point uh, in our bottom trawl time series at unbelievable biomass levels, 500 to 800 kilotons, uh, which just happens to be somewhere in the neighborhood of our uh, fish community objective. 
but you can also see that once we reached about 1997 or 1999, I should say, uh, these large size bloater, these adult bloater that are fish over 120 millimeters have been on a downhill slide since then. And there's really no evidence uh, that there's been enough recruitment coming from the population to do more than replace that are the fish that are there, the older fish that are there. In fact, you can look at this slide and argue, well, they're not even accomplishing replacement because there's continued decreases. The same thing is more or less true from the acoustic survey data. Uh, this is the same uh, organism, same size category from the acoustic survey. And you can see, uh, even though we have a f quite a few uh, short, few years shorter data set that we see higher biomass in the 1990s and very, very low biomass in the 2000s. Um, this pattern is pretty striking uh, when you uh, think about what I have to show you here. We have uh, here a measure of the age zero bloater from the bottom trawl survey. Um, age zero bloater are one organism that we think we can track well with the bottom trawl survey at uh, the earliest uh, stages. You can see that there were pretty high recruitment levels or production of young levels in the 1980s when bloater were at their peak. But we've also had some sizable year classes later on, 2005, 2008, 2009. And same thing shows up in the acoustic survey. This is a graph showing the same size category of bloater from the acoustic survey. We have slightly different timing in when we had large numbers of uh, young of year bloater, but it's pretty similar. And the take home message is we've had some pretty strong year classes in both surveys, but we've not seen any subsequent increase in the biomass of larger bloater. This is in contrast to what's happening in Lake Huron. Um, some of you will probably stick around to see my talk that will talk, mention that on uh, Thursday. So we're going to move to rainbow smelt. Rainbow smelt will be the last uh, organism that we consider to be uh, assessed well by both surveys. And uh, we're going to focus on just the larger rainbow smelt, 90 millimeters and greater. And much like a number of other species you've seen, uh, we had a period of relatively high rainbow smelt biomass earlier in the time series up through about the mid-1990s. And since that time, we've had a decrease to fairly low levels. We did have one point in here in recent years where there was some elevated smelt biomass, but uh, they're basically uh, at the or near the lowest level we've observed in this time series. Um, same thing goes for the acoustic survey. A little bit more variation, but you can see much higher biomass in the 1990s. And then we see a decline uh, to much lower levels in 2001, a short period of elevated biomass, and then a long slide uh, to where we are now. We have to be frank. We don't know a whole lot about what's regulating the abundance of rainbow smelt or their recruitment but we are currently um, involved in a project with a grad student who's looking at uh, recruitment of rainbow smelt and we'll be looking at everything from predation to climate change to try and uh, provide some better understanding of what's going on with this population. So another thing we can do with the acoustic survey that we're not able to do with the bottom trawl survey uh, uh, now that we have Dan Yule and some other folks to thank for a lakewide survey, uh, acoustic survey in Lake Superior, is start to make some comparisons in the biomass of pelagic fish in the three upper lakes. That's pretty key in my mind. We've never really been able to do that. We've had some ideas about you know, what's going on with fish in these lakes, but we've never ha had this apples to apples comparison. That has been fairly sad because we've seen a lot of uh, talk, including a number of papers that have mentioned this idea that there's been a convergence of the lower food web in these three upper lakes to the point where Lakes Michigan and Huron are looking more and more like Lake Superior. We can't really say that there's been a convergence for the fish because we don't have the apples to apples time series to use, but what we can say is for the data we've been able to garner, there 
is very strong evidence that there's no difference in pelagic fish biomass in these three lakes. One of the things that is really important to note, though, is there is, in spite of this similarity in their biomass, a very clear gradient in community composition, with Lake Superior being, uh, as you would expect, dominated by these native corregonines. Uh, Lake Huron, somewhere in the middle, uh, what you see in Lake Huron 2012 is a little different from what we saw in Lake Huron the previous year. There's been a trading back and forth between bloater and smelt dominance in Lake Huron, but the bottom line for Lake Huron is there's a lot more biomass in the form of a native species bloater than there is in our Lake Michigan, which is dominated by two species, as you will see, uh, one of which is um, from the acoustic perspective, alewife. So now I'm going to talk about species that are sampled only uh, with the bottom trawl. These are species like sculpins and gobies. Um, and I'm going to cover a couple of topics that are bottom trawl centric as well. So this is a graph showing uh, the time series for the deep water sculpin in Lake Michigan. And one thing to say about this uh, time series is the 2012 data point is the lowest it's ever been. The second is even though it's the lowest it's ever been, it really doesn't appear to be much different from the previous year. Um, we've had a period from about 2007 onward of really depressed deep water sculp and biomass. I'm not sure we know why that is. Slimy sculp and slightly different story. We have uh, a lot more um, variability in slimy sculpin in recent years, but it's pretty clear that we also have seen some recent uh, trend to lower biomass of slimy sculpins in Lake Michigan as well. Finally, the round goby. Round goby is a tough one to talk about because uh, we don't always catch them at all the sites. There tends to be fairly high levels of uncertainty in our biomass estimates for these fish. So it's tough, tough to talk about trends or uh, anything else, but what we can talk about is the fact that they do make up a fair portion of the biomass relative to all the other species. Um, and finally, uh, another uh, native fish that's at all-time lows is nine-spine stickleback. Uh, they're really uh, facing uh, some kind of paradigm shift. We thought that for a period of time, uh, they were at elevated biomass levels that, in a way that was you know, facilitated by uh, the expansion of dracaenid muscles, but it seems like we've maybe have shift out of that <laughs> paradigm into something new. So I mentioned dominance of uh, a couple of species in uh, this fish community. This uh, pair of graphs hopefully will drive that home. On the left, this stacked area chart, I guess is what I would call it. It just shows the total biomass in kilotons in the whole lake on the y-axis, year on the x-axis, and the cor colors correspond to different species, and the colors match between this pie chart and this chart. And what we can see, we're basically at an all-time low for total fish biomass in Lake Michigan. And it, um, we're somewhere in the neighborhood of 20-ish, uh, or 15 kilotons compared to where we were here, that's a pretty major difference. Now, the mid-late 80s, that was in part driven by very, very high levels of bloater biomass. Um, we're fairly sure that until we reach a point where bloater resurged like that, that we're not going to reach those biomass levels. But uh, unless, of course, Cisco come back because they weigh a lot per individual. But um, if you look at this pie chart, you can see very clearly that there are two species that make up 81% of the total biomass. That's alewife and round goby. And it just sort of drives home the point that I made in that uh, stacked bar chart for the acoustic survey that uh, the fish community is dominated by non-native fish. Quagga mussels are another interesting story. We'll admit that the bottom trawl is probably not the best way to assess quagga mussels, but we think it gives us some useful trend information anyway. Um, what we see is a lot of variability. What we see in addition to that variability is fairly high levels of biomass instead of you know this reading one to two to three kilos per hectare where 
maxing out in the order of 50 to 60 kilos per hectare. That's kind of dwarfing what we've gotten for any fish species in this survey. So finally, I'm going to talk to you about take-home messages. Uh, these are uh, what we're drawing as conclusions from these data uh, up to this point. First of all, alewife. Alewife are still a great deal lower than they were in the 1990s. Uh, this alewife population is currently being sustained by basically one year class that has not shown any evidence, uh, and it's a population that's not shown any evidence that it's responding to decreased survival by becoming mature at smaller sizes. Um, our forecast of alewife biomass for 2013 includes a, a wide range of possibilities, ranging from the lowest we've observed to about average. Some folks will argue, well, that's really not very satisfactory, that's such a wide range, but the simple fact is um, that's the kind of uncertainty that exists in the annual survival of these fish, and there's not much you can do about it. Um, so the age truncation is something that we saw in Lake Huron before the alewife collapse in Lake Huron. We've not had anybody look at uh, the question of whether or not alewife in Lake Huron had a life history response to the predation pressure they faced by maturing at smaller sizes or earlier ages, although we do have some data someone could take a look at. Uh, I'm not sure that's really all that informative as long as we're tracking what's happening with them in Lake Michigan. Uh, second, the bottom trawl survey uh, would tell us that the biomass of some key native species uh, are at all-time lows. In particular, bloater, deep water sculpin, and nine spine stickleback are at all-time lows. Bloater and the deep water sculpin, uh, that's something that we have um, considered as uh, a pair of fish that maybe we can't assess perfectly with the bottom trawl survey, or for that matter, as far as bloater are concerned, with the acoustic survey either. And we question at times, because we have a limited bottom depth range over which the uh, bottom trawl survey samples, whether or not we're really adequately sampling deep water sculpins, whether or not we're going far enough out into the lake to really get to where deep water sculpins are. That same thing can be said about any species, really, because uh, there may also be uh, migrations of these fish from shallower water to deeper water during the day that we're not aware about, and it's possible for them to swim. Chuck Mendenjian's done some back-of-the-envelope calculations that bloater can swim 20 miles a day. Um, so uh, we're really thinking hard about the possibility that some of these uh, some of the fish in these lists are you know, things we're not able to assess uh, as well as we'd like to. Um, consistent with the bottom trawl conclusions about native fish, but a little bit different because we're talking about some different species, uh, data from the acoustic survey would tell us that key native fish are still absent. The last time a, an emerald shiner was captured in any form of sampling by our lab in Lake Michigan was 1962. Um, there may be some other folks in this room who are out there enough that they're seeing those fish that I don't know about. Uh, that was certainly true in Lake Huron. You know, bait guys were seeing um, emerald shiners when we weren't. But um, in addition to the emerald shiner, there's a couple of key fish that are missing as well. That's the Kai and the Cisco. Um, we'll hear more about Cisco uh, later on, maybe about Kai as well, but it's very likely that the lack of these fish has uh, really had some food web level effects on Lake Michigan. Um, and I, I'm getting kind of tired, to be frank, of going out in the middle of Lake Michigan in these nighttime acoustic surveys, and there's either no fish out there that I can see, or there's young of your alewife in the epilimnion and metalimnion. We see no fish out there for huge areas of this lake that undergo dial vertical migration. That historically had to have been a very important conduit uh, for energy and nutrients between the benthic and pelagic zones. And you know, we can say at the very least that's likely the case because that's what's happening in 
Lake Superior. Um, that uh, being said, um, I'm not going to argue I know why Chi I aren't there. So um, I mentioned to you we had some concerns about whether or not we were able to adequately assess a couple of species in the bottom trawl survey thinking maybe we needed to get out into deeper water. Well, our response to that thinking is we're going to add uh, three uh, toes or three locations to this survey at a uh, bottom depth of 128 meters. These are sites that were historically sampled at one point uh, by folks at our lab. So we're pretty confident we can sample there without losing a whole bunch of trawls. So we're going to try and pull that off in 2013. Uh, and we may be uh, successful in doing that in the long term. The uh, fifth take home message is uh, one related to the fish community objective that uh, talks about our, our fish biomass goal, uh, 500 to 800 kilotons. It's pretty clear from these two surveys, uh, 15 kiloton biomass from the bottom trail survey and about 30 for the acoustic survey that we're nowhere near realizing this fish community objective. Um, but again, you know, I think we can think about in th this in the context of you know, the food web and the fish community and it's likely, as I said earlier, that without bloater we're not going to get to a point where we are at that level. Um, diversity is another key that's highlighted in the fish community objectives and we're not there. Um, we have the fish community dominated by alewife or alewife and round goby depending on which survey you're referring to. Um, I think that uh, there are a lot of reasons for that lack of diversity and some of them might be related to the fact that alewife are uh, a dominant portion of the biomass in the lake. There's a lot of literature that drives us or drives home that point. Um, I think that uh, the other thing that I want to drive home more and more that, I, that I'd really like to see us thinking about more and more, especially now that we're reaching the point where we're starting to have some quantifiable similarities and differences uh, among the three upper lakes is this question of ecosystem function. Um, I mentioned earlier that much of the offshore is devoid of pelagic fish that equals very little DVM. In addition to that, um, we can move right into this last bullet um, that is you know, a highlighting of the similarities and differences between the three upper lakes. We have very similar biomass levels. We're starting to see fairly similar um, deep chlorophyll layers. We're starting to see fairly similar levels of chlorophyll, fairly similar levels of zooplankton biomass and community composition with the exceptions that maybe Steve Pothoven talked about today. Um, we're starting to see um, a lot of convergence, if you will. So you know, thinking about that convergence, you know, it's pretty clear to me that we have to ask, you know, how can uh, fish communities or lakes that seem similar uh, in this number of ways actually function? And what are the differences in how the food webs in those lakes are actually working, how fish communities fit into the food webs. Um, I think that we have a lot of that information already uh, from the different lakes. I'm not arguing that we necessarily need to do more research, but I think it's a very important topic if we're to try and understand what's happening in some of these lakes that are more impacted by non-native species, you know, things like alewife and rainbow smelt, uh, round goby for that matter. Really, you know, we've reached a point where I think with some thought and effort we can start answering some of these questions. Um, with that, I think uh, I'll say thank you for uh, being here today. I'd like to acknowledge the folks that were uh, part of this work, including the Fish and Wildlife Service on the acoustic survey. I appreciate that work. There are a lot of folks I'm not acknowledging uh, that were involved in this as well. Uh, it takes a lot of work to pull off these surveys and uh, frankly we're pretty happy to be able to have at least one person here to talk to you about all the work that we put into this. And with that, oh, I'm not supposed to have that there. That's supposed to be say questions. <laughs> um, 
I tried to leave myself about five minutes for questions, uh, and that's um, pretty close to the mark there. Yeah, yeah, we do have time for questions, so ask away. Chuck. 